If anything has become clear in the waning days of the Synod on the Undermining of the Family 2018, it's that a general worldliness has taken over the church. You might be wondering why I'm not hammering on the issue of same-sex attracted priests and bishops like I typically do. I'm not doing that right now because sexual depravity isn't the real problem. Even violations of priestly celibacy, the favorite of more moderate voices, is not the real problem. The problem is the church embraced worldliness, and it did so in at least two instances in the 1960s. One was at the Second Vatican Council, when John XXIII called for an opening of the windows of the church to the world, and the other, and frankly far more insidious than the, than the desires of a possibly naive pope, was the Pact of the Catacombs. The Pact of the Catacombs is a bit of conciliar history that has largely gone underreported. Many traditionalists know little about the pact that was made in, the in late 1965 by 42 bishops in an ancient church, and the few voices that do report on it tend to operate in the fringes of Catholic media, frankly like me. The pact was signed in secret, though the secret did not remain a secret for long, as upon the closing of the council, these bishops went home and informed their staffs about the intentions moving forward. Its stated purpose was to return the church to her early Christian roots, a statement thoroughly condemned by many preconciliar popes who combated the heresy of modernism. The following is the document itself. My reading of that document will be followed by a brief take on the modern-day party line. The Pact of the Catacombs, Domitia, a poor servant church. We, bishops assembled in the Second Vatican Council, our conscience of the deficiencies of our lifestyle in terms of evangelical poverty. Motivated by one another in an initiative in which each of us has tried to avoid ambition and presumption, we unite with all our brothers in the episcopacy and rely above all on the grace and strength of our Lord Jesus Christ and on the prayer of the faithful and the priests in our respective dioceses. Placing ourselves in thought and in prayer before the Trinity, the Church of Christ and all the priests and faithful of our dioceses, with humility and awareness of our weakness, but also with all the determination and all the strength that God desires to grant us by his grace, we commit ourselves to the following. We will try to live according to the ordinary manner of our people in all that concerns housing, food, means of transport, and related matters. See Matthew chapter 5, see Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 8. We renounce forever the appearance and the substance of wealth, especially in clothing, rich vestments, loud colors, and symbols made of precious metals. These signs should certainly be evangelical. See Mark chapter 6, verse 9, Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, Acts chapter 3, verse 6, neither silver nor gold. We will not possess in our own names any properties or other goods, nor will we have bank accounts or the like. If it is necessary to possess something, we will place everything in the name of the diocese or of social or charitable works. See Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Luke chapter 12, verses 33 to 34. As far as possible, we will entrust the financial and material running of our dioceses to a commission of competent laypersons who are aware of their apostolic role so that we can be less administrators and more pastors and apostles. See Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. We do not want to be addressed verbally or in writing with names and titles that express prominence and power such as eminence, excellency, lordship. We prefer to be called by the evangelical name of Father. See Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28, 23, verses 6 to 11, and John chapter 13, verses 12 to, 20 to 15. In our communications and social relations, we will avoid everything that may as a, appear as a concession of privilege, prominence, or even preference to the wealthy and the powerful. For example, in religious services or by the way of banquet invitations offered or accepted. See Luke chapter 13, 12 to 14, 1 Corinthians 9, 14 to 19. Likewise, likewise, we will avoid favoring or fostering the vanity of anyone at the moment or seeking or acknowledging aid or for any other reason. We will invite our faithful to consider their donations as a normal way of participating in worship, in the, ap in the apostolate, and in the social interaction. See Matthew 6, chap uh, verses 2 to 4, Luke chapter 15, 9 to 13, 2 Corinthians 12, verse, uh, uh, verse 4. We will give whatever is needed in terms of our time, our reflection, our heart, 
our means, etc., to the apostolic and pastoral service of the of workers and labor groups, and to those who are economically weak and disadvantaged, without allowing that to detract from the welfare of other persons or groups of the diocese. We will support lay people, religious, deacons, and priests whom the Lord calls to evangelize the poor, and the workers by sharing their lives and their labors. See Luke, see Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, Mark chapter 6, verse 4, Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. Acts chapter 18 verses 3 to 4, verses uh, chapter 20 verses 33 to 35, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 12, chapter 9 verses 1 to 27. Conscience of the requirements of justice and charity and of their mutual relatedness, we will seek to transform our works of welfare into social works based on charity and justice, so that they all take they take all persons into account as a humble service to the responsible public agencies. See Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, Luke chapter 13, verses 12 to 14, and chapter 13, verses 33 to 34. We will do everything possible so that those responsible for our governments and our public services establish and enforce the laws, social structures, and institutions that are necessary for justice, equality, and the integral, harmonious development of the whole person and of all persons and thus for the advent of a new social order worthy of the children of God. See Acts chapter 2 verses 44 to 45, chapter 4 verses 32 to 35, chapter 5 verse 4, and 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 16. Since the collegiality of the bishops finds its supreme evangelical realization in jointly serving the two-thirds of humanity who live in physical, cultural, and moral misery, we commit ourselves a. to support as far as possible the most urgent projects of the episcopacies of the poor nations, and b. to request jointly at the level of international organisms the adoption of economic and cultural structures which, instead of producing poor nations in an ever richer world, make it possible for the poor majorities to free themselves from their wretchedness. We will do all this even as we bear witness to the gospel. After the example of Pope Paul VI at the United Nations, we commit ourselves to sharing our lives in pastoral charity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, priests, religious, and laity, so that our ministry constitutes a true service. Accordingly, we will make an effort to review our lives with them. We will seek collaborators in ministry so that we can be animators according to the Spirit, rather than dominators according to the world. We will, try to, we will try to make ourselves as humanly present and welcoming as possible, and we will show ourselves to be open to all, no matter what their beliefs. See Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 35, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. When we return to our dioceses, we will make these resolutions known to our diocesan priests and ask them to assist us with their comprehension, their collaboration, and their prayers. May God help us to be faithful. Here's the party line take on the pact from that rag, the National Catholic Reporter, published in 2015. We should view this in hindsight of all the entire mess that's unfolded in the church since 2015. Again, this is the official line on the pact of the catacombs as understood by those who work to support the ongoing revolution in the church. From the National Catholic Reporter, Secret Catacombs Pact Emerges After 50 Years and Francis Gives It New Life by David Gibson. Rome, on the evening of November 16, 1965, quietly alerted to the event by word of mouth, some 40 Roman Catholic bishops made their way to celebrate Mass in an ancient underground basilica in the catacombs of Domitia on the outskirts of the Eternal City. Both the place and the timing of the liturgy had a profound resonance, the church marked the spot where tradition said two Roman soldiers were executed for converting to Christianity. And beneath the feet of the bishops and extending through more than 10 miles of tunnels were the tombs of more than 100,000 Christians from the earliest centuries of the church. In addition, the mass was celebrated shortly before the end of the Second Vatican Council, the historic gathering of all the world's bishops that over three years set the church on the path of reform and an unprecedented engagement with the modern world launching dialogue with other Christians and other religions, endorsing religious freedom, and moving the Mass from Latin to the vernacular, among many other things. But another concern among many of the 2,200 churchmen at Vatican II was to truly make Catholicism a church of the poor, 
as Pope John XXIII put it shortly before convening the council. The bishops who gathered for Mass at the catacombs that November evening were devoted to seeing that commitment become a reality. So as the liturgy concluded in the dim light of the vaulted 4th century chamber, each of the prelates came up to the altar and affixed his name to a brief but passionate manifesto that pledged them all to try to live according to the ordinary manner of our people in all that concerns housing, food, means of transport, and related manners. The signatories vowed to renounce personal possessions, fancy vestments, and names and titles that express prominence and power, and they said they would make advocating for the poor and powerless the focus of their ministry. In all this, they said, we will seek collaborators in ministry so that we can be animators according to the spirit rather than dominators according to the world. We will try to make ourselves as humanly present and welcoming as possible. And we will show ourselves to, op to be open to all, no matter what their beliefs. The document would become known as the Pact of the Catacombs, and the signers hoped it would mark a turning point in church history. Instead, the Pact of the Catacombs disappeared for all intents and purposes. It's barely mentioned in the extensive histories of Vatican II, and while copies of the text are in circulation, no one knows what happened to the original document. In addition, the exact number and names of the original signers in the dispute, though it is, still be though it is believed that uh, only one still survives, Luigi Bat Batazzi, nearly 92 years old now, Bishop Emeritus of the Italian Diocese of Ivrea. Yet in the last few years, as the 50th anniversary of both the Catacombs Pact and Vatican II approached, this remarkable episode has finally begun to emerge from the shadows. That's thanks in part to a circle of theologians and historians, especially in Germany, who began talking and writing more publicly about the Pact, an effort that will take a major step forward later this month when the Pontifical Urban University, overlooking the Vatican, hosts a day-long seminar on the document's legacy but perhaps nothing has revived and legitimated the Pact of the Catacombs as much as the surprise election in March 2013 of Argentine Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio, Pope Francis. While never citing the Catacombs Pact specifically, Francis has evoked its language and principles, telling journalists within days of his election that he wished for a poor, a poor church for the poor, and from the start shunning the finery and perks of his office, preferring to live in the Vatican guest house rather than the apostolic palace. He stressed that all bishops should live simply and humbly, and the pontiff has continually exhorted pastors to have the smell of the sheep, staying close to the most in need and being welcoming and inclusive at every turn. His program is to a high degree what the Catacomb Pact was, Cardinal Walter Casper, a retired German theologian who was close to the Pope, said in an interview earlier this year at his apartment next to the Vatican. The Pact of the Catacombs was forgotten, said Casper, who mentioned the document in his recent book on the thought and theology of Francis. But now he, Francis, brings it back. For a while there was even talk in Rome that Francis would travel to the Domitia Catacombs to mark the anniversary. While that's apparently not in the cards, the Catacomb Pact is everywhere now in discussion, as Casper put it. With Pope Francis, you cannot ignore the Catacomb Pact, said Massimo Fagioli, a.k.a. Mr. Bean, a professor of church history at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a key to understanding him, so it's no mystery that it has come back to us today. But why did the Pact of the Catacombs disappear in the first place? In reality, it didn't, at least for the church in Latin America. The chief presider at the Catacombs Mass 50 years ago was a Belgian bishop, Charles Marie Himmer, and a number of other progressive Europeans took part as well. But the bulk of the celebrants were Latin American prelates, such as the famous Brazilian Archbishop and Champion of the Poor, Dom Helder Camara, who kept the spirit of the catacombs packed alive, as best they could. The problem was that the social upheavals of 1968, plus the drama of the Cold War against communism and the rise of liberation theology, which stressed the gospel's priority on the poor, but was seen as too close to Marxism by its conservative foes, okay, made a document such as the Catacombs Pact radioactive. It had the odor of communism, said Brother Uwe Heisterhoff, a member of the Society of the Divine Word, the missionary community that is in charge of the Domitia Catacombs. Even in Latin America, the pact wasn't publicized too widely, lest it poison other efforts to promote justice for the poor. Heisterhoff noted that he worked with the indigenous peoples of Bolivia for 15 years, but only learned about the Catacombs Pact when he came to Rome to oversee the Domitia Catacombs four years ago. This stuff was a bit dangerous until Francis came along, said Mr. Bean. Indeed, some reports say that up to, to 500 bishops, mainly Latin Americans, eventually added their names to the pact, and one of them, Salvadoran Archbishop Oscar Romero, was gunned down by military-backed assassins, 
for speaking out against human rights abuses and on behalf of the poor, in the view of many for preaching the message of the Catacombs Pact. Francis too seemed to have imbibed the spirit of the Catacombs Pact, though there's no evidence he ever signed it. As a Jesuit priest and then bishop in Argentina during the turbulent decades of the 1970s and 80s, Francis became increasingly devoted to the cause of the poor, as did much of the Latin American church. It was no great surprise then that this year he pushed ahead with the beatification of Romero, which had been stalled for decades. Just last week, Francis used remarkably sharp, lang sharp language to denounce those who had slandered Romero's reputation. And he just canonized Oscar Romero this past weekend. Francis was also familiar with the case of his fellow Argentine church churchman, Bishop Enrique Angelili, an outspoken advocate for the poor who was killed in 1976 in what appeared to be a traffic accident, but which was later shown to be an assassination by, military dict by the military dictatorship that ruled the country at the time. Angelelli was a, also a signer of the Catacombs Pact, and Francis last April approved a process that could lead to sainthood for the slain bishop. For many in the U.S., on the other hand, the catacombs have chiefly been deployed as a symbol of persecution, and often by conservative apologists who argue that secularizing trends are heralding a return to the days when Christians huddled in the tunnels for fear of the Romans. Heisterhoff smiles at that notion. Here in the catacombs, it was not a place to hide, he explained. It was a place to pray, not so much a refuge. That's a point Francis himself has made. The Roman authorities knew where the catacombs and the Christians were. It was no secret hideaway. The catacombs even grew as a place to bury the dead after the empire legalized Christianity in 313, as believers came to honor and pray for them in the hope of the resurrection. When the catacombs really represented, Heisterhoff said, it was a church without power, a church that featured what Francis has praised as a convincing witness, a radical vision of simplicity and service that the Pope says it ne is needed for today's church. So as the Pact of the Catacombs and the true message of the Catacombs themselves reemerged for good, much may depend on how long Francis, who turns 79 in December of 2015, remains Pope and can promote his vision of a church for the poor. Moreover, the economic message at the heart of the Catacombs Pact is just as controversial today as it was when it was signed 50 years ago. Capitalism may have won the Cold War over communism, but income inequality and economic injustice remains, and or are worse than before. We, kind of ab we cannot absolutize our Western system, Cardinal Casper said, explaining the theme of the Catacombs Pact. It's a system that creates so much poverty that's not just. The resources of the world belong to everyone, to all mankind. That is what it's saying. Upon reading the document and the party line article from the National Catholic Distorter, one thing stands out. While much of the document is laudable, there is a real emphasis on materialism. Yes, the church and her princes should be concerned with, the, with aiding the poor and alleviating their misery, though, as our Lord told us himself, we will always have the poor among us. But the call to build a new social order, in the clear language of globalism, smacks of modernism. In prior decades, church documents would focus on the establishment of the social reign of Christ the King, and the implication of what that social order would look like. Now the focus is on managerial issues related to alleviating the poor. We see this in much of the work of the church today. The language of the harmonious development of the whole person in conjunction to working with governments is a stark departure from traditional language employed by the church. And notice something is absent in the pact. Where is the talk of the salvation of souls? It's striking that at the close of the council, the most critical part of the church's mission, salvation, is entirely absent in a pact made between bishops before God. And then there's the language of leveling the church hierarchy by forsaking titles and the like. The church is a hierarchical organization, regardless of what past and present reformers wish. But today, the emphasis is on social justice, and this call for social justice focuses now on the members of the acronym community and normalizing their lifestyle in the church, regardless of what sacred scripture and sacred tradition have to say about it. However well-intentioned, the Pact of the Catacombs has been thoroughly demonstrated to have been severely erroneous. If Pope Francis is the embodiment of that pact, as the National Catholic Distorter says, the end result is a church more openly worldly than those bishops that, that Francis rightly punished for building themselves mansions. No servant of Christ should live a life of luxury not suited to his state, and the bishops sanctioned by Francis deserve their chastising. But the logic of the catacombs and of the council itself is obvious. 
by focusing on the plight of the poor with nary a thought to salvation and the spreading of the gospel and with the odious uh, the, or, and with the obvious focus now not on the poor but on whatever group the world has decided is oppressed at this given moment again presumably the acronym community we see the fruits of this pact on stark display error rampant error that has taken the focus off of god and placed it on man like so many other aspects of conciliar thinking and worldliness is always characterized by a rise in sexual depravity and sexual immorality. It's not a coincidence that the golden age of sexual abuse in the church, as it were, was right during the council in the 1960s and in the 1970s in the aftermath of the council. Indeed, the lowest points in Western history have always corresponded to a dramatic rise in adultery, sexual deviancy, and sexual-related mental illnesses. We see that in the broader society today, and we see it at this abominable synod as well. I'll leave you with this. Bishop Robert Barron, of whom I'm typically not much of a fan of, for the same reasons most traditionalists aren't, said at a press briefing at the synod that the church should be open to the acronym community. But like everyone else, they are called to conversion, and that's the correct answer, other than one sticking point. No one should identify with their sexual desires. That's massively disordered. The call to conversion requires removing all the attachments to things that separate us from God and submitting to God and the moral authority of the church. The real problem today is that the church is in the process of surrendering what moral authority she has left. The normalization of these sins combined with the institutionalized cover-up of abusive priests and hiding of, the tar and hiding of the targeting of seminarians by these priests is a surrender on the moral question. And that is a disastrous position for the church to be in today. If you like videos like this, like and share this video and subscribe, and click that notification bell below. I can be found on Twitter and Facebook with links in the description. For Return to Tradition, I'm Anthony Stein. Viva Cristo Rey.